So welcome. Thank you everyone for coming out on this lovely evening. It's sunny out, so appreciate you choosing to be inside with us uh, today. We are being recorded and broadcast, so I just wanted to make sure that you all you know, were aware of that. Um, it will be available online uh, after the event. And we have um, just a couple of quick safety check sorts of things. If for some reason we needed to evacuate, there is an exit on this side of the room, and there's also an exit on this side of the room. The bathrooms are located right through here. So, you know, kind of a, a little awkward with questions, but if you need to use the restroom, please feel free to come up and, and use as needed. Feel somewhat like a attendant or a flight attendant. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, we have um, meeting point. If we need to evacuate, the meeting point is actually in the field over here. Agenda is up here, like I mentioned. Uh, we will go through, do kind of the welcome. We have a couple of presentations. And then the majority of what we're going to focus on tonight is questions and thoughts from you all. We really want to hear your feedback. Um, we have staff here that are able to answer, you know, real technical questions. And all of the board members are here to, you know, give some thoughts and, and hear your feedback. Um, this is actually one of our favorite meetings to be able to come up here and interact with all of you. So again, thank you so much for taking the time to come up here and share your thoughts with us and hear what, what we're doing at EWIP. Uh, so I'm going to go through. So my name is Sonia uh, Carlson. I'm the EWIP board uh, president for this year. I've been a commissioner since 2017, and I represent uh, Ward 6 and 7 in, in Eugene. And in my spare time, I'm a real, a real estate broker. So in my spare time. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John Borowski. Each one of us will go through and announce our, or will uh, introduce ourselves, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Frank to start the presentations. So, here, John. Okay. Uh, my name is John Borowski. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> my name is John Borowski. I am the commissioner for Ward Two and Three, which is in South Eugene. I've been on the board for a couple of years now. And I also am a restaurant tour down in UJ. Hi, my name is Mindy Schlossberg, and I'm the at large commissioner, which means that I represent everybody. Um, I've been on the board since 2019. And by day, I am a speech language pathologist and I work with preschool age children throughout Lane County. Good evening. My name is John Brown. I've been on the board for this is my fifth term, so it's like 17 years, my last term. Uh, in my daytime, I'm doing part time commercial real estate and as much fishing as I can as soon as I get rid of this. <laughs> Hello, I'm Matt McCray. Um, I serve uh, wards one and eight in Eugene um, and uh, been on the board now for a couple of years and uh, in the daytime over for Lane County supporting wildfire recovery from the Holiday Farm fire. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it over to Frank Lawson, our general manager. Thanks. Well, good evening, everybody. It's always nice to see everybody. I do have the coldest seat in the room. Just, just if I look like I'm sort of stiff and shivering, it's because I am. Um, so th thanks for coming out. Um, we have uh, a couple of quick presentations that we're going to give you. These are really highlights of a couple things that we think are really important for this area. One will be an overview of all the watershed recovery work uh, that we're doing up here in the Mackenzie Valley. And the other one will be an update on uh, the decision that we made to decommission the Lieber hydroelectric project and where we are with the decommissioning action plan. Uh, but before we get to that, just a, a few people uh, and to point out around the room uh, for also, if you have questions, uh, we do have um, uh, Misty, uh, in the corner here, uh, as well as Charlie. Uh, they are really experts on our products and services. So this could be things related to holiday farm fire recovery, for example, or uh, our normal services such as energy efficiency, conservation programs associated uh, with septic systems and septic tanks and all kinds of things. So they're the experts on and how the programs work and how they're administrated. So um, please reach out to them or if you have questions during the Q&A, uh, they'll be available to help us with the response. We also have our Pure Water Partners um, table. So if you want to know a little bit more about that program and the, the stewardship arrangements that we have, 
uh, and are making with residents up here. Um, uh, that really, Susan, you'll get to talk later, so I won't inter introduce you. Um, we do have also a table and we have experts on all of our hydroelectric projects up the McKenzie Valley, uh, including Carmen Smith, um, as well as the Liebert Project, Walterville, and what we're doing from a dam safety program as well. Um, that's DAM, not DAMB safety. So just, just uh, so you know what they're doing. And then kind of in the back corner, we have um, a group that's uh, really uh, experts in a lot of things we're doing uh, relative to our wildfire mitigation planning, emergency preparedness, tree trimming, all those things associated with that. Uh, I don't know if you recall, but um, last fall, it was September 9th, uh, we did execute our first public um, safety uh, power shutoff called a PSPS in this area, lasted for about 36 hours. And so that group is also looking if you to get some feedback from you on that experience and what that was like and how we can interact with, with you better under those kinds of conditions and circumstances. Um, so a lot of experts in the room. So when it comes to Q&A time, uh, please don't uh, just limit yourself to the topics that you'll hear a little bit more detail about. We do have experts in the room with a number of different subjects. So um, thank you for joining us. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Susan and Nancy. We're going to talk a little bit more about what we're doing uh, from a from the standpoint of uh, watershed investments here in the Mackenzie Valley. Thanks, Frank. I'm going to let Nancy start. Take over from you. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Nancy Toth with our Drinking Water Source Protection Program here at EWA. And I just wanted to kind of remind, hopefully, everyone of some of the products and uh, programs actually that we have uh, for folks in the watershed. So uh, Frank mentioned our Pure Water Partners program, and this program is a voluntary program where landowners in the McKenzie can get help with replanting, and we've done a lot of this, particularly after the fire. Some invasive species removal. In some cases, we can help with fuels mitigation and erosion control measures. And we also have a nature scaping workshop every year that I'll talk about in a moment, and some free firewood program through the McKenzie Watershed Council and Pure Water Partners. We also have septic system assistance programs, and recently we've gotten septic system grants, and Misty and Charlie can help talk about those afterwards. And we also have funding for home site relocation if you're able in your rebuilding process to move your home further away from a river or stream. And we have information on undergrounding electric service lines and energy efficiency incentives for new construction. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to mention that our nature scaping workshop, which I think is the next slide, yes, has been set for Tuesday, June 6th at 5 o'clock right here in this room. And this is hosted by our Pure Water Partners program with the organizations listed above, uh, plus someone from the Oregon Department of Forestry who will be here to talk about fire resilient landscaping around your homes and in your properties. So this is a chance Every year we do a workshop where you can learn a little bit more about how to landscape your property using native plants and kind of where to locate them depending on site conditions, soil, slope, things like that, and how to uh, use those plants in a way that allows you to use less chemicals on your lawn and less water and kind of save you uh, some time and money in the process. So you're welcome to attend this and RSVP to me uh, and hopefully see some of you here on Tuesday, June 6th. And so just to remind everyone about our septic system maintenance program, this is for homeowners in the McKenzie watershed near rivers or streams. And we've recently increased our rebate to $300. And this is to encourage regular septic system maintenance uh, for your system and to protect water quality as well as save money over the long run. So uh, you are eligible to apply for this rebate every three years to look at your systems and get them inspected and pumped out. We also have zero interest loan uh, program available uh, if you have to do a major repair or re replacement for your system, and that can be up to $20,000 in a zero interest loan. We also now have uh, received around $3 million of federal uh, grant funding through the American Rescue Plan Act 
and that is for homeowners whose septic systems were damaged or destroyed in a holiday farm fire. And so you uh, may be eligible for up to $35,000, depending on some of the criteria, the type of system, et cetera. So there are some criteria. You must use a DEQ certified installer, be the property owner, et cetera. But these are retroactive funding uh, available since March 3rd, 2021, or that's how far it can go back if you've already repaired or replaced your system. So please see Misty and Charlie after this if you'd like more information about this program. And I'm going to pass it on to Susan now. Hi, I'm Susan Fricke. I'm the Water Resources Supervisor at EWEB. Um, for those of you who worked with Carl Morgenstern or knew him um, in the community, he was a great asset to EWEB. He retired March 1st. And so I'm supervising the program now that he was over, which was the source water protection, drinking water quality compliance, and our water quality lab. So I just wanted to do a quick couple slides on some big restoration work that's going to be going on um, in the McKenzie, just so you all know. Uh, we do this, we're doing this large scale phased restoration stuff. I think everyone is probably driven by Fen Rock and see some of the work that happened there. Um, we have some other work planned, but we can, we've got our great partners that we work with too. That's um, Mackenzie River Trust, Mackenzie Watershed Council and the Forest Service on this. And these are pictures from Fen Rock. And this was showing what it looked like. Here was the side channel. And here was what it looked like before the project. And before um, the fire, here's after the fire, and then there's after the project. So down here is what was considered phase one, and that happened, um, what, two years ago now, I think. And so this summer, what I wanted to highlight for you all is up in this area, they're going to be doing phase two, and that will start the beginning of June. Uh, we're not sure, sometime probably June 1st to 3rd, so you will see some equipment bulldozers, excavators, all that stuff mobilizing up there. You'll see people working around that period for the summertime. And then that will wrap up um, by fall. So I wanted to highlight that for you. And then also um, close by on Ford's Creek Road, there's going to be a bridge replacement on Pond Road. And that one will be done this fall most likely. That might change a little bit. So that's some of the bigger activities that have to do with watershed restoration that are coming up in the next year. And if you have any questions about that, please just contact me. That's it. Oh, I'm sorry. Now I'm going to be handing it off to Lisa and Mark. Yeah, you oh, All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Krentz, at UWIB's Electric Generation Manager. I'm sure many of you in this room have questions or concerns about the Lieber decommissioning decision. And so we're here tonight to talk about that, tell you a little bit more about the process, what to expect in the coming years, and to take any questions or comments you might have. We did put together just a few slides, but we're going to keep it brief so that we can keep the majority of the time open for questions and discussion. Next slide, please. First thing I wanted to do was introduce our project team, although I know many of you in this room already know us. Uh, again, I'm Lisa Krentz, Generation Manager. Joining me up here tonight is Mark Zinnaker. He's our Generation Engineering Supervisor. And then the rest of the project team is also in the room. Adam Spencer is back there. He's our Communications Specialist. Jeremy Samoji in the back corner over there is our project manager, and Robin Lady um, sitting back there in the purple is our regulatory specialist. So this is the core team that's going to be working on our plans for decommissioning uh, Uber Dam. Next slide, please, Laura. So just a real quick recap. You are all aware that the canal has been watered since 2018, primarily due to seepage issues at the Cogswell Creek and what we call the Ains area. And then subsequently, additional studies showed that there were um, seismic vulnerability concerns along the entire um, or most of the portions of the canal. Next slide, please. So again, this is just a recap. So um, with the understanding that the fix was going to be a lot more complicated than we expected, uh, we undertook an evaluation to determine what our best option was for the future of the Lieber Canal. We started with 11 alternatives. Those were narrowed down to four that we did a comprehensive um, evaluation of. Next slide, please, Laura. Thank you. So we conducted a triple bottom line analysis to look at the social, economic, and environmental uh, benefits and e impacts of each of those four alternatives. And as you know, and not surprising to any of us, there are a lot of issues that need to be considered um, in this decision. Next slide, please, Laura. Thank you. That culminated into a recommendation and ultimately the board's approval of that recommendation in January of this year to decommission the Berg um, Hydro Project partially 
um, by converting it to a stormwater conveyance facility while preserving the option to uh, restore to pre-project conditions at some point in the future. I'm sure you've all seen the recommendation, but I wanted to just highlight the seven main points of it. The first is to permanently discontinue electricity generation at the Lieber project. The second is to remove Lieber Dam. And again, this is largely also based on the fact that we assume this is going to be a regulatory requirement um, from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and other uh, regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction. Um, the third part um, is, you know, we understand that Lieber Dam provides access both to residents and the Lieber Catchery. And so there is a need with the removal of, of Lieber Dam to provide an alternate access board. And so we will be doing an analysis of that. I recognize that's a big hot topic issue for all of you. You have a lot of concerns. And so we want to talk about that process a little bit, take your questions and comments, and then tell you more about how we're going to get to um, the ultimate outcome there. And that'll come a little bit later. Uh, the fourth part of the recommendation is to repair the canal for stream and stormwater conveyance. And again, preserving the option to naturalize it to pre-project conditions at some point in the future. And then again, we recognize that there are going to be impacts. So looking for mitigation opportunities to uh, reduce those impacts, primarily for hatcheries and irrigators, uh, water rights for irrigators. And then because the Lieberg and Walterville developments, although practically operated independently of each other, are combined together under one operating license from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So anything we do with Lieberg is going to have some sort of regulatory impact on Walterville. So the recommendation also included doing a similar triple bottom line assessment for the Walterville project by 2030. Although we do plan to do that much earlier than that because we recognize that that outcome is going to help inform how we go through the Lieberg process. And then finally, the recommendation included um, identifying opportunities for our Board of Commissioners to engage in the process and to um, you know, provide guidance and perhaps redirection should we get inform new information that might change um, the ultimate path forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so what happens next? It's actually quite a lot. And so and it's kind of a complicated process that most people have never um, had the opportunity to go through. So I wanted to provide it at a high level so you know what to expect in the coming years. The first step of the FERC process, um, again, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, we call it FERC, um, is to make a decision on what our preferred alternative is for the path forward. That's essentially what the board did in January when they approved the recommendation to move towards decommissioning. That's the first step of the process. We got to figure out where we want to go and then we figure out how we get there. The next step in the process is preparing an application. This is a major component and will take several years. This, this is the part of the process where EWEB will engage with regulatory agencies and other stakeholders to actually determine what decommissioning on the ground looks like. So a lot of those details that so many of you want to know will be fleshed out at a, a high and sometimes at a detailed level during this application process. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission needs a pretty detailed application in order for them to be able to evaluate it and go through the approval process. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens during this application uh, phase is we typically and expect we will need to do studies and data collection to inform how the decommissioning plan and what we actually want to propose to the FERC. And again, there's consultation and outreach throughout this process with various uh, agencies. Prior to filing the application with FERC, we, we do provide a 30-day um, notice to the public. Once the application is filed, then FERC will initiate their formal consultation. And what this means is that they will engage with regulatory agencies that have jurisdiction over things like the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act. And then FERC themselves will start conducting their own analysis under the National Environmental Policy Act. That's a process that takes a number of years, alternatives analysis as associated with that, and there's public um, process included in many of those steps. After all that's complete, FERC will issue an order. Next slide, please, Laura. And then we still have a lot more work to do before any construction occurs. So once FERC issues an order, then you will need to secure a construction permit. There's often um, the need to write additional management plans that might not have been included in the original application. 
and provide some more detail around the, some of the designs so that we can actually get the construction permits that we need. After all of that's complete, then we move to implementation of actual construction and decommissioning. Following decommissioning, then there's a period of post-implementation monitoring where we make sure that site conditions are as expected. If they aren't, corrections are made. Uh, we go through a reporting process to FERC when we believe everything has been done um, to the degree that, that was intended. We submit that report to FERC and not until after that do they um, notify us that our license surrender is complete. So it's a really long, complicated process with a lot of moving parts. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we're doing this year is developing what we call the Lever Decommissioning Action Plan or the LDAP. This is really a high level plan with key milestones that kind of maps us out how we get to through all of those steps on the previous slides and how things are interrelated. It'll include work plans and estimated timelines for a whole bunch of things. A few examples are shown on the slide, regulatory process, stakeholder engagement strategies, conceptual design development, and there's a whole you know, broad list of other components that will be included. What the LDAP does not include is any specific detail around exactly what decommissioning will look like on the ground. So essentially what the LDAP is, is it's a process to get to the outcome rather than a definition of what the outcome ultimately will be. Next slide, please. Okay, so all of that combined, this is our most aggressive schedule that we can come up with. Um, and so in other words, construction won't begin for at least 10 years. We've got the uh, surrender application um, and some possibly a settlement agreement that will take three or four years. We've got um, once we submit to FERC, their process is expected to take at least two years. And then we have design and permitting after that, which is another few years. So the earliest that construction would begin would be sometime around 2033. And with that, next slide, please, Laura. I'm going to hand it over to Mark so he can uh, tell you a little bit about what we're going to do in the meantime to ensure we're able to safely convey stormwater. Thank you, Lisa. Well, as Lisa just explained, um, major decommissioning will, will not be starting for at least a decade, but that does not mean that you won't see anything happening out on the canal. Um, we've been out of commission for generating power uh, for on nearly five years now, but there's still water flowing through the canal because of the tributary creeks. And it can be quite a bit of water uh, when we have a big storm move through. Uh, that presents a risk that we do need to address. And this slide shows a, a couple of examples of risk mitigation measures. The upper left aerial um, is at the Johnson Creek area. That purple X uh, indicates a concept where we'd be installing a plug in the canal downstream of Johnson Creek and then adding a new outfall so that Johnson Creek could flow directly to the river. On the right hand side, uh, this is the Cogswell Creek area, a similar concept where we'd install a plug in the canal downstream of Cogswell and then direct the flow from Cogswell upstream in the canal to an existing outfall to the Mackenzie River. These projects, um, you will actually start seeing some action as early as late summer with some drilling activities that will be done in preparation uh, for this work. Uh, next slide. We also want to acknowledge that we've been receiving a lot of very good questions um, about the decommissioning process. Um, Jeremy Samoji, our Lieber project manager, and Adam Spencer. Um, have done a great job responding to frequently asked questions. Those FAQs are available for review on our website, and they've also got some hard copies at the table in the corner here tonight. Lots of good questions. Some of them we can answer, but as Lisa was alluding to, um, there's a lot of details to be worked out before we can provide uh, substantial de uh, details on a lot of the tougher questions. We, we can, at this point in time, give you a sense for how we will go through the process of developing those details, but it will be a significant amount of time before those details are settled. Um, as uh, Lisa also mentioned, we've got a lot of stakeholders involved, and that's part of why this process takes so long, is because 
We uh, eWeb's role will be to facilitate uh, decision making with the collaboration of major stakeholders and with public input. For example, on transportation access issues, we will be working very closely with Lane County Public Works and ODOT to come to a, an ultimate solution. On the hatchery issues, it's the Army Corps of Engineers and fish agencies who will be in the driver's seat. Again, eWeb will be involved, but um, in a facilitating mode. There's, um, you know, clearly a, a very large number of stakeholders involved. Um, we will um, take as much time as we can to, to listen to your comments, to listen to your questions, because that helps us understand the issues that we need to raise at the table um, in the course of the decision making project process in collaboration with all of the major stakeholders. So with that, we would like to open up the meeting for uh, questions and comments. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, this is, you know, town hall style type meeting. We really wanted to make sure that we gave as much time as possible for the group, but we also want to make sure that we spread out kind of the who's who's asking questions who's making comments so if i see that there's a number of people with their hands raised i want to spread it around and if somebody wants to have another round then i'll try to get through those first and then loop back if somebody has another comment um, i also want to make sure that um, everybody understands you know we're elected commissioners we we will make comments you know as needed a lot of the technical details and such Will be answered by staff but any of the comments that are made um, from the individual commissioners don't represent the commission as a whole they're they represent the opinion of that commissioner and then um, as a just as a quick reminder for anybody who came in late this is the first time that i think we're doing this here so this is recorded so just you know wanted to make sure that you were aware of that and um, otherwise what we'll do is um, I have one person over here has raised their hand. Anne is, uh, oh, okay, okay. Adam's going to um, take the, the mic around. So I'll just kind of call on people and I'll let you know what order we're going in. And I'll turn it over there. And I did have one last quick note that we have a former ELEB commissioner, John Simpson, in the, um, thanks for joining us, John. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, all right, Adam, uh, let's get this gentleman here. I saw his hand first and then, I'm, well, I'm Scott Roeder and I raised my hand first because I need to go back home and continue to clean up after the federal disaster called the Holiday Farm Friday, which I've been doing every day for two years. Thanks to your decision not to bury your wires in the ground. In case people in this room don't understand how this fire occurred, at milepost 47, there are three of your wires which cross the Mackenzie Highway. As far as I'm told, one of your wires was pinned down because of severe winds by a tree. You de, you de energized your wires as you should have, but they went across the highway and leaned on top of Lane Electric's wires, if I'm not mistaken, and they were re energized without your knowledge. Even if Lane Electric would bury the wires that parallel the highway under the ground, this fire would never have happened. And I urge you again to reevaluate your decision, which benefits you, and as we're owners, all. Of anywhere. It in a way benefits us, but all of the costs, including my coronary heart attack and people who've lost their houses and have been screwed by their contractors or their insurance companies, have not the cost has not been borne by EWIP. So that being said, it is cheaper not to, for you not to bury your wires in the ground, but you should because it's the right thing to do. We love you. Years ago, you wanted to divest yourself of this territory, and many of us turned out and urged you not to do that because we didn't want, I think it was Eveline, wasn't it, or some other utility would take over this territory. That's because we like you, and we appreciate what you do. None of us in this room have the knowledge that you do about the Walterville Canal, and I frankly guess that most of us really don't care all that much about the seepage issues in the Walterville Canal. Most of us do care about the lake. And we'd like the lake to stay, 
most of us, I think, except for the white water rafters. And for all the nonsense going around in Washington, D.C., whether it's an alleged mythical earthquake that's going to take down your dam, that's never going to happen up here. Never. It ain't never going to happen. There will be an earthquake one day, but it isn't going to impact our dam. If, if I was in your shoes as a county commissioner, which thankfully is probably glad I'm not, I'd tell the federal government to go pound sand. Because all the nonsense being generated by Washington isn't is taking our country down. Now, that's all I have to say, and I got to get back to cleaning up the mess. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your, your comments. Um, you know, I do know one of the things that we we looked into and we asked about was whether or not we could keep the dam and stop generation. And we were told that we likely would not be able to do that because if we don't have generation, there's no reason to have a dam there. So I know that is one of the things that we're looking at, but that is part of the reason that I personally made a decision on that. And if you want, if, if not, I saw this person and then we'll go over here. Yeah, there were. Did he leave? Oh, well, there were, I was searching for a question in there, but there were a lot of there were a lot of comments. We, we continually look at undergrounding um, as an example. Uh, it's very expensive um, and the line he's referring to was a transmission line. And if you go to bury a transmission line, it does cost you because it costs about $2 million a mile to bury a transmission line of that size. And that's a 70 mile long transmission line. And so you can kind of do the math on, on that one. Um, that uh, we're, you know, totally uh, cooperating with all the authorities looking at uh, what the cause of the fire was. With the cause report has still not been issued by the federal government he referred to. Um, and it's been almost three years. Um, and we'll look forward to to the hearing what the what the ultimate conclusion of the cause was. Um, but the as far as the the Lieberg decision, there are a lot of things that went into that. Um, as as Lisa mentioned, a triple bottom line. Uh, we also had to look at it from a what is EWEB's mission and what is uh, our objective um, as a utility. Um, we are delivering electricity and water. Um, part of that is that if we have an asset and an asset is not contributing to that mission, we have to try to reduce the risk and reduce the long-term obligation of that. So it is likely that the federal government will say the primary purpose of the dam has been removed, therefore it needs to be removed. It's also probably in, in EWA's best long-term interest to not have that ongoing obligation. Okay, and I saw a gentleman over here, I thought maybe it was, maybe it was you, okay. We'll go there and then we'll get on this side of the room. Yeah. Okay. And then, oh. okay. There, there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm Jeff Caliban and I live on the Shore Drive. I've lived there for nearly 25 years. I started coming up in McKinsey. My grandfather was raised up here. Started using the Lieber Dam Lake when I was probably four or five years old. Spent my life on it. My dream was to one day make enough money to where I could move up and live on the Lieber Lake. And it took me most of my life to do it, but I did it along with several others in this room. And now, you know, you're looking at changing dramatically what we're doing. It, and I would ask you to all look like your golfers and you spent your whole life wanting to play golf and you finally were able to afford that golf course location with your home. And then only to find out that they're going to take away your golf course, but they're going to build Beltline right behind your house. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? I'm losing my golf course, and now I got a, a two lane road that's been a small road for some time. I live on the road, and people in the room see me walk every day. I walk, Lee. I don't know how many. Have you guys ever been on the shore? Mm -hmm. Walk it again. Walk it. Don't drive it. Because when you walk and you turn on the Lee Shore Drive, on the right hand side of Steve's house, the bank drops off big time. On the left is Nolan Pepper, who are now 90 years old. They spent their entire life building this Japanese type garden with a huge pond. You're, if you would make that into a two lane road, you're gonna have to build another bridge over their pond or take away their dream. And as you go down, each one of these people in this room have their dream and you're gonna step on their dreams as well. And we're all getting to the age of elderly. So now you're starting to talk about 
access across the river on the bridge, getting medical. When you do shut down, they park things on the other side to get to it. I'm 64. I've had to use the ambulance service before. It takes time to get there, at least 20 minutes. And now you're going to increase that, that that bridge traffic on historic. It's like try putting a freeway through the freaking Alamo. I mean, this is a historic bridge. It built in 1938, the longest in Oregon, and we all love and, and use it. We used to light ceremonies around it during Christmas, and now we're going to try to turn it into some kind of a, of a, a major thoroughfare. It won't work, and I, I walk that road every day, and I just want to reiterate that not only are you taking away an amazing gem on the Mackenzie River, both economically and beauty-wise, but you're also taking away our dreams and, and everybody's access. We all have dogs and kids and things, and there's no way you can put a road down there. So please, if you're going to do this, at least spend the money to build a bridge where it is if you're going to take the dam out yes, yes. and provide it with access. Because I think a lot of us in the room, and I think for probably a few that I've talked to, realize that if you do take the dam out, we're going to have still have a river. I fish every day, and I'll still fish the river, but don't build a two-lane road on a one-lane road. It will not work. You're going to take out driveways. You're going to take out dreams. You're going to take out, you can't do it. It just simply can't be done. So simply put in either a bridge or another access so that people that live on that area can get to it. Um, so we have emergency access, and don't increase it. The historic bridges traffic. Please don't. I, and I and I say this from experience. I, I use that bridge every day and I walk that road every day. Please, commissioners, people that's in this room, please take the time to walk down Lee Shore Drive. Don't drive it. And then start the dam and walk the other. And then come back to this room and sit down and see how you would feel. And not only is it even feasible, it's not. Mm -hmm. And so that's all I really have to say. And I, I know it's a lot, but that's all I have to say. My name is Tammy Pelton, and I live on the corner of Lee Shore Drive and Good Pasture, and my house would be one of the first ones that get affected by this widening of the road. Um, we came up here six years ago and bought our house there. Uh, we loved the neighborhood, we loved living on the river, and we loved the bridge. And to hear that this is going to happen. Just destroys our dream, just like Jeff said. Our community is a small, very friendly community. We all know each other. And to hear that you're going to come in and widen it, make it a road where there is no road, so that means you're taking people's property, whether you're going to use eminent domain or you're going to buy us out. I don't know. You're going to be tearing down houses to make the road go all the way through. Um, think about it. Build another metal bridge like they have down on Holden Creek. Um, a question about your slides. You said uh, the first process is to decommission and settlement. Who's getting the settlement? Uh, let me explain more about that. Um, you know, the, the, the way the FERC process works is you uh, file an application, but there are a whole slew of regulatory agencies and other stakeholders that if we went that a specific route, we would enter into a settlement agreement that actually defines its settlement agreement process with regulatory agencies and others. We have one up at our Carmen Smith Hydro project that has 17 parties that are part of it. And that is, is an agreement with all of those entities. And, that is in addition to, but bound by our license. So it's some nomenclature that's that's not terribly um, used very often. Um, if so you haven't been part of the hydro world. Your stakeholders and your... It's a very specific legal, um, legally binding document that um, a lot of utilities use when they're relicensing uh, hydro projects and some use when they're decommissioning, but not all. Okay, so you also talked about burying the lines. You know, that's not only affected by the weather, but it's traffic also. Anytime there's an accident and they hit a pole, it takes out everybody's power all the way upriver. So that's just another reason why you guys should consider spending the money. Not at that cost. Yeah. No 
Okay, it's not. Uh, so I saw this gentleman here, and then this gentleman, and then we'll head to the back for, for a little bit, and we'll come back forward. Yeah. Anyway, there's, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Fleur, and I'm from the Lower River, and I wanted to share an observation regarding the uh, the salmon runs and the dams. And for decades, I've been seeing people blame the, the dams for the loss of salmon, and I wanted to share my observation before I got too old to do so. But uh, I saw what happened to our salmon runs. We used to have beautiful salmon runs on the lower river and, and uh, appreciate that there were a lot more salmon spawning on the lower river than up here because we have a lot more gravel beds. And when I, uh, and, uh, when I was growing up there, I mean, I've been there since 1952 and growing up we would do it and do a lot of uh, trout fishing, wading out amongst the herds of spawning salmon. I mean, they were just like walking out amongst the herd of cattle and they would swim in between your legs. And, and there were just so many of them. And then in, uh, in uh, 1969, we had a, a beautiful salmon run and then I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And when I came back from Vietnam in 1971, there wasn't any decent salmon run. And the salmon runs were gone. And I asked my dad, what happened to our salmon runs? And he said, well, the scientists went and tagged the salmon and found out that they go and go up to the uh, Aleutian Islands. Uh, they go up to Alaska and they spend five years off the coast of the Aleutian Islands. And in 1971, the Japanese began using 50 mile long drift nets, 50 mile long. And that's what happened to our salmon runs. And these theories about blame the dams, they ignore, first of all, the fact that most of the salmon were doing their spawning below all the dams. And all the dams were in place and we still had beautiful salmon runs. And then they also ignore the fact of commercial fishing. And if you've got a theory that is ignoring observable facts, then your theory is not scientific theory, it's bias theory. And I've written this up and I've provided it to the board and I hope you people read this. But the dams are not the result, they're not what caused our loss of our salmon runs. It's commercial fishing. And now the, there's some environmental groups that are suing the Army Corps of Engineers to uh, or threatening to sue them and making them drain the reservoirs. And so what we're doing is we're uh, di just diminishing the recreational use of our reservoirs over unfounded theory. It's just a hypothesis that does not, is not supported by the observation and the evidence. And I'm sorry, I got to run home and see how my wife is doing, but I wanted to get that comment in. Thank you much. I just want to get a quick show of hands. How many people want to speak? Question. Yeah. Well, okay, I see roughly somewhere between 11 and 15. So we have, I want to make sure we get enough, you know, as many of you in as we possibly can in the time allotted. So it's about three minutes per person, roughly. So you can kind of self-moderate there just to make sure to be respectful of the others in the room to keep on time okay okay so um i think we said over here this gentleman was up next and then i was going to go loop back to the, the back of the room i have many questions but i'd just like to, to jump to that frank opened up there which is cost and i have the document that Give an estimate of this decommissioning. Way back when you were holding public meetings, whatever you call them, out in the heat, unlike this pleasant place, and this, which you could add to your headquarters, which the final, when you made the final vote back in December, I believe it was, the commissioners meet in a, in a, a room that doesn't even have a a PA system. It does. Okay, I would suggest you upgrade it. But the issue is, has the final decommissioning estimate changed from your triple gold-plated consultant estimates? No doubt. Quite a day. 
So, so if you do go and look at the final version of the report, that remains the estimate for our decommissioning costs. And uh, that is available on the website. And it's so and, and so tell me then, what was the difference in cost between decommissioning and the cost of returning to full service? Yeah, so it, um, roughly the uh, negative uh, that what we were looking at, it was from a uh, net present value perspective and uh, roughly, I guess I'm just remembering these off the top of my head, so roughly return to service was a quarter billion dollars, 250 million in the red and the uh, decommissioning options were around 180. 185 almost. Yeah. yeah. So if you amortize that over 50 years, we're talking about two months. And my real problem have always has been with this whole issue. You lose your own ability to generate power. The only thing you'll have left by the time you're done decommissioning Walterville, which is your next step, this is already preordained because, oh, well, they're linked together and they're licensed together and blah, blah, blah. And it may well be. If, if Frank would just stand up and say, I can't generate power as cheaply as I can buy it from BPA, and that's great. So my only other question is this. There was a McCullough report done by Cantwell, Washington State, which is also affected by BPA. It was done back in 2018 when the Trump administration wanted to sell off BPA transmission lines. The estimate in that report was that it would increase the cost of transmission by 44%. What's your alternative? Well, obviously, if you generate locally, you're not paying transmission costs. Now, maybe I'm wrong about all this, but this is the kind of stuff that those decisions all these people have to make over and should have considered. What happens if the next administration comes along and says, oh, we're selling off these assets because, well, first of all, they're blue states right off the bat. Secondly, we've already tried it once. We'll figure out how to do it this time. Got an answer? We will continue to uh, check our NPV assumptions over time. Definitely the board would like us to confirm. The, the amount of power that we generate at Lever Dam is what, 3% or 4%? It was 4%. We haven't generated power there in five years. So it's a very small portion of our overall portfolio. And part of the process that we're going through right now is making an integrated resource plan that looks at all of the different options available. And many of those other options that were available were much lower cost than, re, than, than recommissioning the Lever um, facilities. So it is part of what we looked at and what went into this. We had over 20 different public meetings, engagements, outreach sessions. This was not a decision that any of us took lightly. Uh, we knew that lives were going to be impacted in a major way. We had what I personally felt like were no wonderful options. I mean, they were all awful options. We we're either raising rates and impacting people in a very dramatic way. Um, you know, people on fixed incomes, low incomes, families, that that they can't absorb that. 80 million doesn't sound like a lot, but that when that translates into bill increases and it's 20, 30, 40 dollars, that can make and break someone. Um, so that this is part of what, what we've looked at when we went into the section. Here's the witness. What that what you do by shutting the shutting Reaper and eventually Walter, you are essentially doing nothing different than a widget maker that takes his factory and moves it to Mexico or to China. Local jobs will be gone. Local generation control will be gone. And you're going to be subject to whoever's selling you power. You become nothing but a wholesaler. You're a middle. Okay. Well, we'll leave it that. There's there. I want to get to other people in the room here. Um, this gentleman in the back, um, with the green shirt on, and then 
Thank you. My name is Rex Starr, and I'm one of the lovely residents on Lee Shore that would forget to uh, entertain the traffic going up and down that road should that option go through. I do understand that there was a study of the of the to you know, the route beyond the end of the county road at the end of Lee Shore through Mrs. Toy's land along the river and through Tad Sharp's land on the other end of Dam Road. Neither one of which I don't think have been contacted by any agency whatsoever about the likelihood of ever trying to negotiate some sort of a price. I'm familiar with Tad and he had not. Okay, number two, uh, you say, well, the, you know, the Liebberg project only generates 4% of your, of your power. That's 4% out of your entire power budget. I don't really much care what it costs you to deliver power in West Eugene. 4% on that Liebberg project could handle the river. These are the people that live here and require power. And that's the, that's the cleanest, closest source there is. Thirdly, dam, my understanding of that dam, part of the original process was um, flood control. Now, I live above the dam, but those people who live down below the dam might enjoy flood control. Okay, that was, a, that was an old, old concept and, and justification for a dam. But beyond all of that, the recreational value to the to the population of Lane County and much beyond by losing Leeberg Lake is significant. And I don't know that anybody really cares except the three or four businesses who get who gain their revenue from people traveling up and down the river and enjoying that process. And those who are trying to build the Discovery Center right across the road from the Leeberg Lake to draw people in and enjoy the process of a, of a Leeberg um, hatchery and its history and the ongoing process that's there. These are all things that I don't know that were ever considered. Lastly, when the when the canal became an issue, did anybody ever, ever, ever consider polylining the canal? They have ponds and lakes and so forth all over the world that are polylined and that immediately stops seepage. Did anybody ever consider that? Thank Good you. Those are, those are a lot of great questions. I'll cover a couple of them. I might ask Mark to cover the polylining one. I did want to talk a little bit about the process for the access routes. So EWIP has not undertaken, nor have the transportation agencies who ultimately have jurisdiction over the access route undertaken any formal studies, at least that EWIP is aware of. We have already met with ODOT and Lane County Public Works around the impact that this is gonna to be to all of you and the need to develop options that um, all parties, including the, the UEB, Lane County Public Works, ODOT, and others um, can hopefully live with. It is a long process. And again, the conceptual designs, um, alternative routes, there are a lot of things to consider around what would be a feasible um, access that provides ingress, egress for emergency, what you know, bridge loading rates are, all of that. We recognize also that there is understandably concern over good pasture bridge. It is a historic bridge. And even the county and Lane County Public Works have you know, concerns around increasing traffic over that. So a lot of questions need to be answered and a lot of work needs to be done to get to those answers to those questions. But I fully recognize, as does everyone on the project um, team, and certainly our commissioners, how impactful the access issue is to all of you. And it would be for me too, if I were in your shoes. Um, so um, more to come on that as we work through um, the process, but please know we have already been in touch and are working with both of those transportation agencies. That's it. I just have one other question real quick. You know, you talk about all the stakeholders you have to deal with. Please look around the room. These are all stakeholders, too, who have a significant financial investment in where they live. And whatever your decision is, if it includes taking that property out, <laughs> impacts everyone in the room. And we are stakeholders. Absolutely, you are. 100% you are, which is part of the reason why we will continue with our stakeholder engagement strategy, which again includes all of you. We want to hear your questions. We want to hear your concerns. We want to be able to evaluate the impacts and ultimately try to find the balance between all of these um, competing impacts that we're trying to, um, again, find the best route there through. It is hard. It is very, very hard. And we recognize that there are impacts to individuals and there are impacts to the broader groups as a whole. 
I did want to say one thing about um, the flood control. So Liebert is, is a unique um, facility. It is, does not provide any flood control. It's what we call a run of the river facility. So it's not like Blue River or Cougar that actually do and were primarily built originally for flood control. Liebert does not provide that. What it does is it passes inflows um, through the dam uh, with the exception of what we divert through the canal for power generation when we were diverting. But it, it's understandably why folks would think it provides flood control because most and many dams do. Lieberg is not one of those. Mark, do you want to address the? Sure, just real quickly. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Poly Miner is uh, precisely what we would want to do if we return to service, but it's not the only portion of the canal that needs, uh, has issues. We would also need to be doing a bunch of structural upgrades for seismic stability because the liner doesn't do anything for us in the seismic event. And so the, the largest driver for cost on rehabbing the canal, five miles of canal, was the seismic. All right, we'll some others in the back and then we'll pop back up here. This is Thank you. I'm Dane Palmer. I live on Lieber Dam Road. Um, my front door will be about five feet from the highway you folks want to put in. Um, I have to maintain that if any of you people on that side of the road lived on we sure drive Lieber Dan Road. We wouldn't be here tonight. You said a minute ago, eWeb considers the impacts to residents. I have never seen eWeb care about impacts to residents. You also said something about the historic nature of Good Pasture Bridge. The dam is historic also. Right. Um, regarding it, point that Jeff made. You take the dam out, you need to put another bridge where the dam was. But here's a cheaper option. Gut the dam, leave the structure there, leave the road. across the river. Right. Pretty simple and a lot cheaper. Amen, Thank you. brother. All right, let's move to the back over here and one real quick check. Do we have anybody that has a different topic that I saw this gentleman over here, so let's do let's. There was one person in the back, we'll go there and then we'll go back here and then we'll get up to the front again. I'll be fast. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Pure Water Partners Group. Um, I'm Jim Russell, Whitewater Ranch. Um, we've been trying to be nice, quiet neighbors uh, over on our side of the south access of the river. Um, Pure Water Partners has been over there a million times, planting hundreds of acres of restoration plants uh, after the fire. So they really deserve a hand from everyone. Regarding what we're talking about tonight, um, I can give clear numbers what um, Lee Shore Drive would have to go through. Uh, like I said, we've been trying to be a quiet neighbor over at the ranch. Uh, we grow, grow blueberries and we have timber. Um, after the holiday farm fire, we had to do salvage logging. Salvage logging requires trucks coming in. Uh, we had a little over 2,000 logging trucks come across the dam. Um, probably no one on Lee Shore Drive knew that. Um, in 25 to 35 years, another 2,000 trucks will need to come in to do the logging that we just planted, right? Every 35 years or so, you have to harvest your trees. We also grow blueberries. Um, right now, we've got 86 acres of blueberries. They've been in the ground uh, since 2012. Last year, we produced 650,000 pounds of blueberries. Our goal is a million pounds of blueberries. Um, 52 foot or 53 foot refrigerated trailer holds about 25,000 pounds of blueberries. A million pounds of blueberries would equal 50 big rigs to come in. That's 50 big rigs going back out. So 100 trips of big rigs going uh, across your um, Lee Shore Drive. Right now, um, those, those trucks sneak through the uh, fish hatchery, the trout hatchery, and across Lieberg Dam. 
once again, probably most of Lee or Lee Shore Drive didn't know we even had that. So I just wanted to put some real numbers on um, what the impact of these decisions are. And uh, if in fact, we actually do have another option on the bridge, we'd love two lanes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Oh, do you want? Oh, I know. Well, a lot of people raise their hands. Hi, my name is Eric Clark, and I live on uh, Greenwood Drive. And I have a question that's not quite as pressing to me as um, the Lieber and Lake residents have, but still important to us. We use um, the path along Lieber Canal for walking, biking um, is a wonderful, wonderful thing that ties the community together, being able to walk from end to end. And actually it's something of a sadness to me that we can't walk through the um, outflow that occurs um, where you have that diversion. Um, so my specific question is, as, Le as EWEB prepares designs for converting the canal to stormwater runoff, will you be preparing two different designs? One that preserves that ongoing pedestrian traffic and hopefully adds it up at the um, runoff um, at the northern or the upriver end um, and one that does not and providing a dollar cost for what it would take to preserve the amenity of that end-to-end -end traversal of the canal as pedestrian. That question does fall in that category of its two Early to say, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's a, there's we uh, obviously do observe a tremendous amount of recreational use of the trails, and there will be options that will be evaluated and studied, uh, and eventually, and and opportunities for input uh, going forward. By the way, just today, the, the trail did reopen there seasonally. We are able to reopen it when we're not passing water through the waste wing gate. So again, it's a full trail. And again, my, my question wasn't so much what your final outcome would be, but rather, will you be evaluating the pedestrian flow and, 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 and be able to assign a differential cost to the parents to spare design without any pedestrian flow and <laughs> provide that continued through passage? Yeah, your comments, I think, ensure that we'll have that option on the table. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary Hatfield. Hi, neighbors. 1962 was a good year for some of us. We were alive, right? Well, I was at McKenzie High. I was a sophomore. In 1967, I was at the University of Oregon. I worked for the uh, U.S. Army engineers to do a survey. Believe it or not, we did a survey up here at Leeburg. We did a survey at a couple other dams. A young kid uh, jumped around and talked to people about why you were coming up to this area and what value you would get out of it. Believe it or not, they said things that all of you talked about a minute ago that hit home for me. You're a very intelligent gentleman over there and the knowledge you have, and my hat tips off to you for that. And one of the important things that was mentioned was the recreational value of these places. Years ago, that dam had speedboats on it. Okay, remember that? Yes. Okay, and years ago, they floated down that river, University of Oregon did, having fun. Remember that? Yes. Until one or two people didn't make it, and they stopped it. <laughs> okay, and maybe they should. But we, we really lose sight of history and facts. In those days, we wouldn't have touched this dam. It meant something to the people, and it meant something to the city, and it meant something to Mr. Brown over there because all of us knew what that river provided and what that dam provided to us up here to be locally talking about this dam. The comments that have been made by my neighbors really exemplify the passion and drive that we have to preserve some heritage, to have the value of that dam for all of us. And yes, 4% electricity, that means something. But the disturbing thing for me is to sit here as an older gentleman in life and to be, I'm sorry, pandered yet, because I keep hearing the fact that we're going to open up hearings, we're going to talk to everybody. At the end of the day, decisions are already made. Yep. I doubt if anybody on this board has changed your mind. And if you have, you're not going to step up and say anything. And was it a universal vote or not? 
And then who talked to you folks about the money that was going to be spent or could be spent in other ways? That's why I tip my hat to this gentleman over here. It makes more sense in a couple of minutes than a lot of you folks have made deciding whether $50 million was good for you or not good for you. Look, I paid my taxes. I paid my EWED bills. I've done it faithfully for all these years. I lost three houses in that fire. And I had one damaged. Everybody came to me and said, you know, that house up there, who owns that? It's got vinyl siding melting off of it. Well, that's Hatfield's house. The one right next to the, the, the Good Pastor Bridge. Yeah. And guess what? I fought that dadgum boat ramp next to my property. We won and then we lost Mr. Brown and they put in a boat ramp, spent all that money. And guess what we have now? You got no lake and you're going to have running down the river. I guess it was important to share this with everyone here because we care. We all took some time out to come talk to you, but it's almost like did the tree fall in the, out there in the forest and didn't make a sound. I'm not sure it made a sound. I think you're all very well-meaning and good natured and good people. But I got to tell you, decisions are made. Do what you're asked to do. I've been there in corporate America for 54 years. Now semi-retired, so I can have an opportunity of chatting with you. And I guess, Mr. Brown, you'll be retired as well. So I wish you well in that. But I don't know that there's anything we're going to be able to do to stop this. But at least we can try to fight like heck to save that dam and the road to access that you folks have and have some semblance of life before 40 years go by. I'm not going to be here. You can drive this thing out to we're all dead. But at the end of the day, we're still here. We still care. And we urge, I hope, all of us, those of us that can, you know, stand up and take a good breath, speak out on behalf of our folks up here that aren't here that have talked to all of us about, please stop it. And if you're not going to stop it, then direct it to a really good lawyer or some Republican or some Democrat that's going to represent us finally, the people, rather than people that aren't necessarily have a stakehold in this thing that we do. That's all I'm asking. We need somebody to help us. Hi, I'm Wayne Ferncoats. I live on Lee Shore Drive and one of the upriver people. I have one question for the commissioners and everybody from me with. Please explain to all of us what Removing a dam, removing a bridge, and removing a lake has to do with repairing a canal that leaks. Yeah. Silence. Yeah. I'm going to take a stab at this and I'm going to count on an engineer to tell me if I've got something wrong. But the canal is an integral part of the whole hydro facility. Um, right, the dam itself doesn't generate power. We run water through the canal and to the powerhouse. So the canal has to operate and it has to be safe in order for that hydro project to work. And the concern here is that when we dug into that canal, we found that when it was built in the 1930s, it wasn't built with the understanding of the seismic risk that we have here. And importantly, the center of the canal is made out of liquefiable soils. And that means if it were wet when an earthquake happened, it would just kind of melt apart like butter and the water would come out of that canal. And whoever's downstream of that would be really negatively impacted. That is the driver for our concern about the canal. And, that, and that's really where the large costs of canal repair come from is because uh, there are several sections of that canal that would have to have major structural repairs. Do I have that all right so far? You did very well. Thank, Thank you. you. So we um, we could remove the canal, but we can't. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission will not allow us, as I understand it, to remove the canal and leave the dam in place. We're not asking that. Yeah, well, that's that's the question I just heard. Why aren't we? Why don't we leave the dam in place? Did I, sure we did. did I miss the question? No, the question is, why? What does taking out the dam 
and removing the yeah. lake have to do with repairing a canal oh. that leaks with stormwater runoff. Yes. You haven't had any water in it for five years. And right. That, well, in order to put water back into it, we would have to make the repairs. You decided yeah. that you're not going to do yeah. that. Yeah, you're going to repair the canal regardless of what happens. No. Why do you have to take out the we're dam and the lake? The, the, the 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 Spike Show said you were going to plug it. Yeah, we're making safety repairs to move the water safely until we can fully decommission. Are you aware that this dam is going to be a capacity? It's not about the seismic capacity of the dam. It's about, it's about, no, no, it's, it's about the seismic. It's about the seismic capacity of the of the canal, not the dam. The canal was tested. What I'm trying to tell you is this: leave it in the Let them talk. There was a 4.2 quake just outside of Walterville. And yeah, it was. I didn't see the canal. I live right below the canal. Yeah, we had, it was very close to the, our Walterville powerhouse. It was a 4.1 event okay. and um, Lee Berg's a high hazard canal. We are required to design it for a 10,000 year return frequency event, which in our part of the world is the Cascadia subduction zone event, so how big which is at a magnitude, a magnitude nine um, offshore event, which is magnitude nine. And we got to make sure we got to be able to have a flood on Cogswell uh, Creek on one of the million year flood. So we have to build it. Well, we know this is not an office for that. I'll tell you that. This is not one. That's what the people like to It's like the whole system. You can have everything you need to get rid of the whole thing. Answer. Okay, let's get back to the question. Three of the seven over here, and they didn't answer the question. What does removing the dam have to do with repairing the canal? If you buy the canal without, I don't understand it. Help me out. I don't I, understand how if we remove the dam, it helps the canal. Could you repeat her question, please? Yeah, so the I mic tour. If I'm hearing, um, I don't. I, I, I apologize for my ignorance. I do not understand why you have to take out the dam to repair the canal. Right. Can't you do why well, can't you repair the canal without taking out the dam? So the dam, it's a diversion dam. Its purpose is to back up the McKenzie River just enough so that we can divert water into the canal. The, it's a uh, it's it's a licensed together. It's a system, the power plant, the canal, the dam. And if we uh, decommission the project, it is a decommissioning of the entire system, not just the canal, not just the power plant, but the, the dam as well. Decommission. Okay, hold up. You're splitting the patent with Walterville with Lieber to decommission half of it. Why are you able to do it with that and not able to do it with the dam? So. That, that's where some regulatory complications come in. We do, uh, and that, that Lisa was referring to, we, there's nothing we can do at Liebert uh, without affecting Walterville. Uh, we will need a, a license amendment in order to decommission Liebert and continue operating the Walterville project, but that is the, the path that we're on right now, that Walterville will continue operating. So what you're saying is you can do it, but you're not going to. We, we cannot uh, decommission a portion of a hydroelectric project. They, they're, they're separately operating systems. We can continue operating one hydroelectric system and decommission the other. Under one patent. Like one license. license. One license. Right. And the amendment would be to split the license so that we do not have to decommission both, but we can continue operating one while we decommission the other. You have shutoff gates at the dam for the canal, do you not? Yes. And those so are use those to shut it off and maintain the canal the way you need to maintain it. It's, a, it it's, a, a, it's a decision that's not within our control. We can propose to do that, but uh, um, have you? Yeah, will you? The, the precedent uh, is that when you decommission a hydroelectric project, there's, there's really a, a very, very low likelihood that you'll be able to keep your dam. Do you have a question? Sure. Um,
Hi, my name is Nadine Scott. I'm a homeowner on Leeburg Lake, and I'm also a real estate broker for Windermere. Um, I have a question. I have I live I live on Leeburg Lake, and I purchased there because I want to live on a lake. I've lived on a river before. It's not safe unless you really know what you're doing and you're a professional. Um, Leeburg Lake is very safe for families and kids, and it's used a lot. I want to know, if you take Leeburg Lake away, how are you going to compensate me for the decrease in my property values? And Sonia, as a realtor, you should really think about this. All those properties are going to be decreased in value because they no longer have a lake that they can use. Something else I wanted to say is that um, this summer, um, many people that live on Weber Dam, Lee Shore, and the lake went around with petitions um, for people who used the lake in a three week period. And we gained 1,100 signatures from people that actually came there with families, use the lake, kayaks, boaters, all of that. 1,100 people in three weeks use that lake. You're gonna take that away from them. That's tourism, that's our economy up here. You need to think about the businesses. That is our economy. Locals cannot support the economy up here. We need tourism. Something else I'd like to say is John, um, Twice I met you down at the meetings at um, the lake and I expressed my concern about this because at the time I was president of the Chamber of Commerce and I'm very concerned about tourism. You told me, don't worry, that lake is not going in with. What happened? Thank you, Thank you Nadine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Um, and I did say that because that was what I was advocating for as I came into this process of becoming an EWEP commissioner. I love the lake. I spent a lot of time upriver. One of my best friends has had a cabin on Gate Creek. I'm familiar with the area, and that's something that I, I was hoping could happen. As, as I learned things, sitting in this chair and learning about all of these things that are put upon us by the federal government, by the state government, by the fisheries, by the tribes, and as a fiduciary duty to my EWEP customers, which you guys are EWEP customers, but there's a lot of e a lot of EWEP customers, hundreds of thousands of EWEP customers, and I've got to think of them as well. The, the way that I think, what? Just as important as all. Absolutely, you are. Everybody is as as important, and everybody else has different impacts when it comes to this decision. The impacts to you guys are really hard and on the ground. The impacts to ratepayers are are a part of the thought as well. We are I, I understand that. Something that that I had to look at was, and, and you asked, why can't you keep the dam or why don't you return the dam to service? Part of return, and this is something that I learned and there's part of it that I'll probably get wrong because again, I'm a restaurateur, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a water resource manager. I was somebody that was elected to represent my constituents and some of the stuff that I learned was, okay, We've got a license on this on this dam till 20 till 2040. If we decided that we wanted to keep the dam and not do anything return to service like some of you are advocating for, that's 200 and something million dollars of work. We need to relicense it again. As you see, Carmen Smith, hundreds of millions of dollars to relicense it probably two more sets of relicensing just to make it worthwhile. So we're talking a lot of money. And when you do that, 
I have to look at what is my long term risk, right? Risk is part of something that I had to do the thing. There's ongoing maintenance. There's there's if there is the earthquake. And so I learned a lot sitting at the table. And when I when I said to you, don't worry, we're not taking the lake away. I was being absolutely genuine with you at that point with the knowledge that I had in my head. I learned more and I came to a decision that I felt the best option for Eugene Water and Electric Board and its customers was the decision that we was the vote that I took. And I'm pissing off people and I'm sorry about that. But that was the decision that I had to make and I live with that. Um, I hope that the transportation issues, I hope we can work those out. We want to be a partner with that, but we're not the drivers on that. I would contact your county commissioners and your state representatives and say, hey, we need enough money to build a bridge and, and, and work with them. And we'd love to partner with them, but I don't know if we can bear the cost. I don't know if I can ask. You oh, can't get down the road. I, the well, road's not going to work for you guys. I am not. EWEB is not. You better fun. think about that. You I, can't get down the Leech Road Drive. I, you got to come up with another way to do it. You either. Why is it? Why is it Lane County here to hear how we feel about this? Why aren't they here? It's convenient for you to tell us how you think, but you need to have. Lane County and uh, ODOT. ODOT. They should be here. We don't know. We don't even know what your your communication with them has been on this issue. But it, I, the honest, you said you've been down Lee Shore. It's not possible to do. I met him when I went on a fishing trip one time over to the the. I can't remember the what. What do we call that fishing hole there? <laughs> yeah, I, I talked to him in his blueberry fields. I didn't have any idea that many trucks would run through there. We cannot get that kind of traffic going down Lee Shore. It won't work. You've been down that street. No, I get it. Bottom line, you guys want to take the dam out to cut your costs. I get that. I get that a lot. So you want to take the dam out? No, I'll, I don't need that. Need you can do it. <laughs> I get that you don't. I get it. I get it. You want the dam out? You're going to have to build an iron bridge, make two foundations across, and set a damn piece of steel up there to cross over right where it sits. Right where it sits. And you know what? You might have to get involved if, with a little bit of that cost because we live up here. But well, I get it. We're, we're not all of Eugene. We're a small individual bu bunch of people. But you can't go up and down. You know, uh, you guys are not thinking the whole picture. You're thinking dollars and cents. Where's the money? You already have a bridge. I know. I, I, um, I apologize for losing my cool. <laughs> And, and, you, and what the only thing that I can say to that is I will look into that as a commissioner and see what we can do. No decision, as far as I know, there has been no decision that we're running Lakeshore Drive. Lakeshore. 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 Jesus, get it right. Lakeshore. Lakeshore. I have one more question, a uh, quick question. Um, several times I've asked the question about has the dam been tested for asbestos? When dams were built in the early ages, uh, like Portland, Portland Cement Company used asbestos in the cement. Um, my response has been from several EWEB people that that's our plan to do down the road. Uh, as a realtor, when I list a house, the first thing I do is have an inspection done so I know what's right or wrong with that house. Why aren't you testing that dam for asbestos right now? Uh, 
<laughs> so um, we we have looked at all the records with respect to construction of the dam. There are no indications of the uh, asbestos being uh, present. We will conduct a hazardous material assessment, not just for as uh, asbestos, but for lead or um, any contaminants that might be present in the lake, Lake River Lake sediments, et cetera. All that will be done. Uh, in the in the uh, unlikely event that we do discover asbestos, it would be abated, just like in, in, in any in any home, as part of the uh, removal of the project. It would not change our cost estimates for removal of the dam. That, those types of contingencies are included in our cost estimates. So, what are you going to do for your water customers in Eugene when that? That structure is taken down, and oh, you do find asbestos, and now they're drinking it. That water feeds your system. Yeah. We live above it. Yay! <laughs> I hear me on It's um, not surprising the emotion in the room. There's been a lot of loss up here. And so hearing that more loss is coming is obviously very devastating. And I'm just curious, is there an opportunity for the dam, um, for the dam to be considered a historical landmark where there could be funding that could come from federal grant funding that could help with a canal? Um, and then maybe that could change what would happen in the future. I know that there was a lot of historical landmark projects that went up and down the McKinney bill up here um, during just kind of trying to help our community out. Um, so I don't know if that's an opportunity, something that was looked at. Yeah, so the Lieber, um, the entirety of the Lieber project is uh, considered a national on the National Historic Register. Yeah. Um, however, uh, we have not specifically looked into whether funding to um, maintain historic structures would be sufficient enough to bridge the gap. Um, I doubt it, but it's something that we could we could certainly look into. We are in the in the process of looking into a number of other uh, funding sources to help bear the cost burden um, for all of our customers, and so that's that's something we consider. Uh, it comes to mind, I was not aware, John just informed me that this seismic issue has to do uh, category nine seismic events. Okay. And that's all being driven by FERC. So we, have, we have a Democratic administration, we have Democratic control of the Senate. Has anyone contacted any of the political people? Because Val Hoyle, Peter DeBazio before her, Murphy, Biden, everybody's all about green energy, green generation, green, and now you're going to pull out 24 megawatts. Green G, and Walter, out of service. Um, facilities that are perfectly functional. Even though they were built a hundred years ago, they're still perfectly functional. So you raise a good point. The design criteria that we need to adhere to in order to return to service is a very, very high bar. And it's political. Every so eWeb ourselves, I don't believe that we have um, which so they have influence you, over my that. Question was, have you engaged with our political representatives to get some sort of a waiver? So that FERC can, can say, yeah, OK, it's good enough for six. We don't need a nine. There's not going to be a nine here. We're not Loma Prieta. We're not. Come on. We're not saying it to different places. So just, just a, a little bit of background. So you know, FERC has a mandate to protect public safety. Dam safety is a, a priority. There have been a number of things that have happened in the nation with dam failures over the last 10 years that have dramatically changed the regulatory landscape as when it comes to dam safety and what the FERC um, believes the design criteria needs to be in order to protect lives. lives. And so 
We are a part of a much bigger system. Our, our facility is rated according to FERC specifications. Um, so there, I'm pretty confident to say there's no such thing as a waiver from FERC for our Liebert project. And um, this is a, a bigger uh, concern around, uh, again, life safety and an organization who is tasked with ensuring dam safety. They take a conservative approach, but when you understand what their mission is, that's where they're coming from. Well, I, just wanted, I want to say that if I could, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that I think it might help you guys to hear a little bit about what I want to say. And, and uh, you know, Gary Hatfield, I went through with heck with him. We fought putting in that boat landing. We hired an attorney, we fought it. Gary was offered a lot of money for that property and he turned it down because we went to court, fought it, and ODOT couldn't reach the sight distance on that on that dangerous corner. And so Gary said, OK, fine, I'm not going to sell them. I'm going to build my houses and, and we're all fine. Well, magically, here's the lesson I learned not being a government guy is that all you got to do is change the rules. And now all of a sudden the sight distance works. Exactly. And now we have a dangerous that's still dangerous. It was dangerous a year ago, but all of a sudden magically it's not dangerous anymore because all we did was change the rules. Now that happens every day in government. So. When you sit here and you're telling us that we can't, we have to go by the rules. I used to believe that, but along with Gary, you've taught me not to. So now you're saying, you know, there is no rules. What happens is you can make whatever you want happen. Now, ODOT can come in and they can say, that's fine, but ODOT can just change the rules. EWEB can just change the rules. Or can just change the rules. Everyone can change the rules. It's easy to change the rules. You just have to have enough people yeah, wanting the boat to change the rule. Excuse me, one thing? Yes. Read it. The most dangerous uh, phase in the languages were always done it this way. Yes. Right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you right now. I, right there. I, 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 before I vote now, I, I'd like to hear Mick and, and Mindy, you answered some of my questions, you know, um, and you, were, you got right back to me on email. Um, but if it works for everybody else, I'd like to change a lot of rules too. I'd like to see, you know, fly fishing only on the lake and no motors on the lake. I mean, yeah. we can all like to change the rules, right? I'd like to have free electricity, but in the end, that's what you're getting. I think what you're feeling here is so many times you guys have changed the rules. ODOT has changed the rules. And Gary is one that's sitting in here that's probably been affected the most by, by a lot of this stuff here yeah. financially. Um, and so I just wanted to say that not because, you know, I think it might help you guys as commissioners to understand what we're dealing with. I can change the rules. I sure as hell can change the rules. You could. We all can change the rules. You okay. So, <laughs> okay, I, I want to make sure. So we're 15 minutes over. So we also want to allow for some other time to go around. Is there anybody who did not get a chance to talk. I know that many have. So I'm going to get these two last people and then we're going to wrap up. I can, I don't know if anybody else can stay, but I'm more than willing to help stay and listen to more of, you know, what you have to say and talk about, you know, one on one what we've been able to go. Okay, I'm Doug Murphy. I live on Leeshaw. Does anybody consider the impact of 126? It's already dangerous. There's a lot of wrecks there all the time. That's right. People turning to get on that bridge. They'll be backed up both ways for a half mile. And they come by that store at like 70 miles an hour. You're going to have all kinds of wrecks on 126. There's already enough. We hear sirens every day, and that won't be safe. It's a one lane bridge. It won't work. Right on. Amen, brother. Hopefully mine's a much less controversial question, um, but I have been uh, privileged to address uh, eWeb's Board of Commissioners numbers of times, and I appreciate being able to do that. But what I would appreciate even more would be for us to have our own commissioner. What would it take, you know, no, no offense, <laughs> you do a fine job, but, um, what would it take for um, the McKinsey Valley to have their own eWeb commissioner? Yeah. From Walter Villa. 
I would just like to uh, comment, same thought. It was just occurring to me, the same thing. We need to be able to vote for our representative. Currently, the Mackenzie Valley does not vote for the EWEP board. We are not represented and we are one of your customers. Right. How right. do we change that? That's a really good change. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, we are empowered by the city of Eugene. We are, we've been uh, in the city of Eugene's charter. So for in, in order for you guys to be able to vote on it, the city of Eugene would have to change their charter. And I don't even know if that, and then that would get referred to the voters. So you would have to lobby the city of Eugene city council to, do a charter amendment. They would put that forward to the voters of the, uh, unfortunately, of the city of Eugene, um, and, and then and then that could be written in. But we've been in the charter of the city of Eugene for 100 years, yeah, more than 100 years. So that that would be the, the that would be the only avenue. And and it's not like we could say yes, we want Mackenzie Valley to vote for us because if we could change the rules, I'm sure that we would do that. We would have a representative that you guys could vote for, but it's not. No, in a, uh, well, none of you represent us. No, no. We have, well, we have, we have different <laughs> wards, but none of you represent us. We took a poll, you had 800 people vote to keep the lake. You had less than 200 people who said they want to open it to the river. The 800 people that said keep the lake do not live inside the city limits of Eugene, and you're not listening to them, but they are stakeholders. Every one of us is a stakeholder. Every one of us is a customer, and we have, we should have a voice, and 800 voices should have a little more power to you in your decision making than 25 or 100 that come up from the city and say, we want the river to run free. That's your words and your reports, what I just quoted roughly. Correct. Well, we have the public comment period and, and also all the signatures that Nadine was referring to. We had about 450 people respond to the survey. About 200 or so said, um, you know, wanting to preserve and uh, recommission, and about 120 said um, to decommission. Um, but it, it wasn't a public vote. Um, it's up to our elected officials to make the decision. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm the communications lead on the project, so I thank you all for having that say. And we, we've changed how we're going to do the project and we've learned things and that's all important. And that's why we're here to continue to learn um, how we can carry forward and work with you all and learn about issues on the road and, and study that and walk the road with you, Jeff. And, and you know, we're, we are your representatives. They are, they are your representatives, even if you don't directly vote for them, um, but that's why we're here and that's why they're here to listen to you all. So. Is there a chance of a change of mind or is that written in stone already? Okay. Yeah. Well, what I will also say too is that there, there are a number of other people across the Eugene area that are also customers that don't get to vote, but I, mean, I personally and many others, we spend this time up here because we do care. We're all volunteers. We want to hear what you have to say. Otherwise, we could choose not to come up here, but that's not what we're about. This is why we had 20 different meetings to come and listen to you. And many of the things that you've said made us ask other questions in those 20 different meetings to try to figure out if there's a better way to go about it. And there are a number, unfortunately, regulatory requirements that we're constrained to. So I, I thank everybody for coming this evening. There are some, there are the tables around the outside. And if you'd like to stay for those who can and would like to talk to any of this, um, like I said, we'd be willing to, to do that. So thank you again. I know one, 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 one quick question, please. One question. Can all of you stand up and say, or tell me who voted yes to decommission this? Was it unanimous? Sure it was. That's why they're sitting there. It's unanimous. And the decisions were made 
before we got up here, uh, what's going to happen? There was no way for us to impact anything except to put it down. If you're in a public meeting, get the folks, listen to them, then you move on. Sorry, but that's what happened. You have the public meeting. That's it. More than there. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you.